Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. For more than 50 years, the U.S. Army War College's Eisenhower Series College Program, or ESCP, has been designed to encourage dialogue on national security and other policy issues between War College students and the broader public. In pursuit of dialogue, War College students in the program travel across the country, speaking to college classes, voluntary organizations, think tanks, and other public forums. In our age of corona and social distancing, the ESCP has had to scale back some of their travels, although I'm happy to say that this year they were able to begin some traveling. Here at A Better Peace, we have aimed to help pick up the slack by giving Eisenhower program participants a chance to share their expertise and insights. Today's podcast is the second in a planned series of three such programs. Today's topic is Afghanistan. America's longest war, and its most recent international trauma. Our guests today, three members of the U.S. Army War College Class of 2022 and members of the Eisenhower Series College Program, have served and studied aspects of the American intervention in the graveyard of empires, and join us to share their perspectives on what happened, what it means, and what we can learn from it all. Colonel Matthew T. Adamczyk, commissioned in June 2001 as a second lieutenant in the infantry from the United States Military Academy. He served in a variety of command and staff positions, primarily in airborne and light infantry units. He has had six deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, his last one ending in May of 2021 as the last U.S. commander in TAAC South. Lieutenant Colonel Rob Greiner is an Army strategist. Prior to his academic year here at the War College, Rob was a faculty instructor and deputy director at the U.S. Army War College's Basic Strategic Art Program. He's also served as a strategist at Army Headquarters, Department of State, Human Resources Command, and at NATO as a lead planner for its mission in Afghanistan. Rob holds degrees from Ohio University and Yale. And finally, Colonel Kevin Payne is a military police officer with over 25 years of active duty service. His experiences include command at Camp Bukha, Iraq, and the United States Disciplinary Barracks. Key developmental positions in Fort Hood, Texas, and staff positions in the Pentagon and at the United States Army Military Police School. He has deployed on multiple occasions to Iraq and Afghanistan. And in his next assignment, he will take command of the 15th MP Brigade, and the United States Disciplinary Barracks Commandant in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Welcome to A Better Peace, Joe. Thanks, Ron. Great to join you. Thanks, Thank you. It's great to have you here with us. Now, as, as regular listeners of this podcast know, um, in, a, in a typical Eisenhower presentation, each of you would make a brief speech to the audience. And so I want to give each of you, in alphabetical order, the way I introduced you, a chance to summarize what your speech would have been if we were sitting together um, in front of an auditorium full of people. So I'm going to start with you, Matt Adamczyk, please. Yeah, Ron, uh, thanks for the opportunity. And as, as we began the Eisenhower program and we were looking at our topics, I, I was wondering what I really wanted to, uh, to engage with, with college students and, and the, the public writ large. Um, having recently returned from Afghanistan and like so many of uh, our classmates, having the opportunity to, to reflect, to reflect on our, our experiences and, and begin to answer the question of, of if it was worth it. So that's where I started from. And, and I don't have an answer for that question. And I don't know that anyone will for quite some time. And, and even then, uh, you know, it'll be determined by the context of the time and the individuals doing the measuring. So what I looked at as I, as I returned, um, was this idea of why we were there for 20 years. And, and Dr. Chris Hammer down at the Air War College 
wrote a pretty uh, uh, famous book, American Pendulum. And one of the uh, topics that he discusses in there is this pull and push between our American values and, and our, our vital interests as we're looking at national policy. And I thought that would be a good place to, uh, to start and engage in. And so as I, as I looked back on it, um, if we recall all the way back to uh, September 11, 2001, the, the heinous attacks, Congress passed the authorization for the use of military force. And that clearly um, delineated the, the reason for, for our intervention in Afghanistan. And it was, uh, it was pure interest. It was to prevent future attacks on the United States. Um, and then by 2003, um, President, President Bush had declared an end to major combat operations. And what happened at that point um, is there was a bit of a swing. So we had the, the President Bush administration, the Obama administration, uh, President Trump and President Biden. And all of those uh, administrations promised to end the war. Uh, many believed that our interests had been achieved, but yet we continued. We continued well um, from the end of major combat operations through what we saw last summer. And what what was guiding uh, the, the administrations, at least from their speeches, um, President Bush uh, addressed the nation with terms like, we will make Afghanistan a better place to live. Uh, President Obama uh, used uh, phrases the ideals that have guided our nation and led the world, a belief that all people uh, will should be treated fairly. That is a light that will continue to guide us. And so what I felt and, and thought as I, I looked at this was our interests were being overshadowed by values. Um, in 2002, not surprisingly, 93% of the American population supported the war in Afghanistan. Uh, only 10 years later, 52% um, supported it. But interestingly, 60% said we had accomplished our mission. And so as I, uh, as I looked at this and, and continued, one of the lessons I, I struggle with and, and discuss with uh, our audiences during the program was what role did our national interests and values, understanding the two aren't you know, mutually exclusive, play in extending the war well past the end of major combat operations. So that's uh, that's kind of like my, my, my brief rundown right there. We're going to come back to this too, because I am th precisely this question of, you know, why do we do what we do and, and why do we decide to keep doing it, right? I hope we'll, we'll be able to circle back to that. But I want to go ahead and, uh, and let Rob step in. And uh, since his, his speech topic, uh, so it provides an interesting both counterpoint and reinforcement for some of the issues that you've raised, Matt. So go ahead, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Ron. So uh, it's been very fascinating engaging with members of uh, society on this issue of, of Afghanistan, uh, particularly because it's Ukraine right now that's dominating the uh, the news cycles and our and our nation's attention. And so, kind of the first thing you have to do is is invite them to to hop into your your, your way back when machine, right? and see if you can take them all the way back, you know, a whole eight and a half months ago when it was actually this culmination of our mission in Afghanistan that was uh, kind of at the forefront of the, of the national psyche. And, you know, I'd like to offer to you, I, I don't know for sure if the tragic events surrounding the actual withdrawal were preventable, but I would argue that the mission's overarching trajectory, you know, one that really engendered the strategic culmination that we witnessed there on TV. I think it could and should have been anticipated. And I come to this conclusion really by analyzing the mission through the lens of Clausewitz's secondary trinity. Right? You, you can't have a War College podcast, I don't think, unless somebody mentions Clausewitz at least once. We, 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 right? It's the only way we keep our license, Rob. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah so, so looking at the mission through this trinity, right, I, I identify variables that, that may have induced a strategic character that was predisposed to the unfavorable outcomes that we witnessed on TV. Um, and why use theory? Um, a lot of society aren't familiar with Clausewitz. I did have one emphatic individual jump up with excitement when I mentioned uh, Carl, but uh, that was the only one out of everybody I spoke with. Uh, well, war is arguably among the most complex of human endeavors, right? And one way to make sense of, uh, of these you know, Byzantine challenges is through the lens of theory. 
these well-constructed theories that permit us to, to decompose a multifaceted and complex problem uh, and to really kind of form a basis of evaluation uh, with which to approach it. And in this magnum opus on war, Clausewitz provides just that sort of framework for us. And he proffered that the, the attributes of a war are really shaped by how a nation balances the interplay of three elements. And I'm going with his secondary trinity. I think that the Clausewitz aficionado would be quick to recognize this. His secondary trinity, right? Those three elements are the government, the military, and society. And this Trinitarian framework, it affords us really significant analytical benefits because we can approach the war and the complexities of Afghanistan through examination of its parts, right? And so when you apply the elements of the Trinity, each vertex against the U.S. mission in Afghanistan, we can start to identify uh, patterns and shortfalls at the strategic and the national policy levels. Um, that's really, I mean, many of these are irremediable decisions that we made early on in the war, but it helped shape this, what I'm calling the strategic character uh, that really proved terminal in its outcome. Right? And so under each of these vertexes, uh, the government, the military and society, I think, um, you know, we made certain decisions that proved to be rather immutable. And just by way of example, you know, within the, um, uh, within the government vertex, for example, uh, it was our really inability to articulate what that policy end was. What was our aim in Afghanistan? And Matt spoke a bit about kind of the admix of, uh, of values and interests, right? But we, we never really truly articulated what is our interest as a nation for being in Afghanistan. Uh, and because we didn't have this coupling of strategy to policy, right? We saw a rapid permutation of the mission, one that went from flexing our military muscle to then trying to flex our, our national values, right? Within the military, uh, obviously, I think first and foremost, the competing priorities of Iraq that I'd offer to you as well, a, kind of a, a state of overconfidence, right? Our indomitable spirit and optimism might have dulled our ability to, to accurately discern progress. Uh, and I don't spare society either, which is interesting uh, in these discussions. Um, you know, out there with uh, with civilians who have very little exposure to the military, right? It's it's foreign policy illiteracy, really. Uh, and it's a disinterest due to a, a lack of agency in the mission in Afghanistan. So you take all these things and you kind of put them together and you end up with uh, a strategic character of war that was predisposed to the outcomes that we witnessed. You know, this it, it does make me think, right? It's a good, good political science term comes to mind when you describe it that way. And that's overdetermined. Um, that it's almost it's almost too easy to have predicted things that have happened. But of course, that didn't mean that it was that easy to predict that they were going to happen before they that's right. It's always easier looking backwards as well, right? It is always easier. That's, that's that's why I'm in the history business, Rob. That's what I do do a lot of. But it's always but it's a very important thing. Thank you, Rob. And then Kevin, um, let's bring in your your speech here, which gets to some of the issues of what it was like to try to govern or help to govern Afghanistan and what it means going forward. So please go right ahead. So thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's it's an honor. So, so the lens that I viewed Afghanistan and the problems that we had uh, in, in that country were from the lens of corruption and the effect on legitimacy, nation building. I took a look at counter-corruption measures that were implemented because I was a part of one of those teams. And then I also looked at lessons learned, which we could utilize for future environments. Uh, it, it is an extremely complicated environment, and, and we fully understand that. But the problem of corruption is not just limited to Afghanistan. Uh, the, in fact, the Biden administration just uh, initiated the U.S. strategy on countering corruption because it is so much of a problem in the United States. So I want to be very clear that this is this is not a problem which is uh, independent or, or exclusive for Afghanistan. And you can also look at Transparency International's Corruption's Perception Index. Uh, which is a measurement of the level of corruption in, in countries around the world. Uh, if you want to get a better perspective of, of where the United States falls, where Afghanistan falls uh, in a historical fashion. And as Rob said, as we all watch the fall of Afghanistan play out over time, I ponder what role corruption played in its downfall. How, how critical was it in, in exacting the, the very specific uh, downfall, which we all witness on TV. And so as I, as I dug into this problem, I looked at the different types of corruption, uh, whether it was petty or administrative corruption, 
uh, which deals with the, the deprivation of basic necessities of life, or the one that I saw the most uh, as a member of one of the counter-corruption task forces was corruption within the institutions, uh, which degraded legitimacy, um, altered political appointments, and essentially altered policy within the institutions, in my case specifically, the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of, of Defense. In addition, we, I looked at partnerships, uh, which were forged by the international community, uh, which contributed to the degradation of legitimacy from the local population to the gov government. Specifically, in my case, it was sec the security sector officials, which I work with day to day um, in the Ministry of Interior. Also investigated the measures the international community uh, took on in terms of counter-corruption organizations, specifically Task Force Shafafiat, which is uh, the task force which worked for the International Security Assistance Force. I was a member of security sector reform. Uh, we worked side by side with the Ministry of Interior, Inspector General, and the Ministry of Defense uh, day to day. And, it, and our, our goal was to institute counter-corruption uh, programs to inform and enhance the transparency and accountability within those institutions. It's extremely difficult. And finally, amongst the, the, the myriad of lessons learned that uh, I, am, I uncovered and discovered, uh, a lot of it is to have a common understanding at the strategic level of the, the priority of corruption and how it affects legitimacy and nation building. Not to say that we didn't have that understanding, but it did take nine years for organizations such as Task Force Shafafiat to be established. So nine years after uh, the initiation of hostilities, again, keeping security in mind, however, nine years later, we begin to, to really fight the problem of corruption. Um, security sector reform was critical to the effort. Uh, we had significant difficulties in, in fighting that. However, uh, I am still proud of the work that we did. And then, of course, viewing the problem from a Western viewpoint, and that's something that is difficult for us to, to avoid. Uh, and, and those are the institutions and practices that we view as successful. However, every environment is different. So there are a myriad of lessons learned. There are a myriad of uh, measures which were instituted in Afghanistan. I don't believe that they were a total failure, but, but I believe that we have to look at it realistically and, and capture the lessons learned for future environments should we be asked to do this a similar type of mission. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Now, and, and I would say that what, what I see when I hear, when I hear the, the three presentations, right, that there is a, the, the linkage here is, uh, you know, it is easy to say when things don't turn out the way that we had hoped they would turn out, had turned out to say, well, we should have known all along that they were going to turn out badly. And some people will say they did know all along. Um, but, right, we are supposed to be, and I say this, there's, there's a certain army ethos, right, that we don't take on problems because they're easy. We take them on because they're hard, right, and we're trying to solve problems and to try to figure out what does it take for an organization to take on a particularly difficult challenge. Um, and especially if one is going to take a long time, right? How long do you have to give to a problem before it's all right to say, maybe we can't solve it? Um, and so I, I had, on the list of questions I had for all of you was sort of the, you know, what went wrong and what went right in Afghanistan. But what the question I wanna ask all three of you um, is how should, and then this is the, one of the most dangerous word, one of the most dangerous words in the English language is should. But how should the United States, the U.S. Army, um, approach a difficult long-term challenge like Afghanistan? Is it just we should just uh, don't ever don't ever uh, attempt one again because they don't turn out well? But how should we manage it? How should we manage expectations? And especially, how do we deal with the question? And this is how this gets back to the, the, the point that you raised, Kevin, that really sticks with me is the idea of the corruption of institutions. 
Um, one of the things that, that people said after Vietnam, and I think one of the things that people are saying after Afghanistan is when an institution keeps saying everything is going great until it's not, um, what does that do to the credibility of the institution? Um, but do we fault the leaders of an institution for wanting to imagine that things are going to turn out well? Or do we say, because we can never really look into their souls. This is this turning into a longer question than I intended, but I hope that you'll stay with me here. Um, that we can't look into people's souls to know whether they know they are not telling the truth. They may be expressing their hopes with more confidence than they should. But how do we imagine dealing with a long-term question, being honest about the possibilities, feeling constrained by our national values or our national interests. Like we're going to, we're, we're, we are here because we're here and we have to justify why we are still here. Um, how, sh you know, what, what can we take away from the Afghanistan experience to get us to reflect on this idea about how we deal with very difficult long-term problems? I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go back to Matt first on this because, you know, you were, you know, of, of all of us here, right? You were, you were in Afghanistan most recently, we'll put it that way. Um, and so what do you think about this when, when people ask you or they talk to you about what we were doing there? Yeah, Ron, I, that, that is a, that is a, a doozy of a question. Um, it, uh, sorry about the that. First thing I, <laughs> no, no, I, I, but it's one that that you know we've been we've been struggling with, and I think we'll continue to struggle with it uh, for quite some time. And I think as we look at our national values, I think there's you know that can can pass down to layers. And you look at um, you know the values we have as a military, um, you know as a society, but but in terms of the military. We're a learning organization, but at the same time, we're an organization that just doesn't like to lose. And so I, I think that there's likely um, a tendency for us to believe that regardless of the challenges uh, present, uh, that that we can we can do it. Um, you know, we want one one more year um, and. And I, I'm not sure where I, I sit with Rob in terms of not really understanding. I think we had a clear understanding of what we we wanted to or needed to accomplish uh, in Afghanistan, although it, it probably wasn't written out very well. Um, and where I think we might have gone wrong is a belief or an inability to really understand and paint the picture at what the actual cost would be. And I think we continue to work incrementally along the way vice um really understanding as as kevin points out this is going to take a generation it's going to be a generational commitment to achieve uh what we we're driving towards and i don't know that um that was something we were prepared to say um because we just we we refuse to lose um and and uh sometimes maybe our, our judgment can be clouded by that and that's at multiple echelons it, and i don't purport to even you know imagine to be, you know, have been in the room where these discussions are, are taking place. But what I do believe is that values of the organization, values of the country, values of the actual individuals making decisions, you know, had had a had a arguably an outsized role in determining the course that we were going to take until we came back full course um, with President Biden. We said, OK, what are the vital interests uh, at hand here? So I don't know if I answered the question, but I, I do think that, um, oh, well. you know, uh, we knew it would be a generational yeah. thing. And I mean, I'm reminded of what, what in class I often say, right? I'm not I'm not expecting answers. I, I'm expecting responses. And that was definitely a thoughtful response. I, I got to ask one follow up question, uh, Matt. And that is uh, when you left Kandahar in, in May of 2021, um, did you all know that uh, you were leaving and never coming back? When I say you, the United States Army. Yes. Um, you know, the decision had at that point been made. And so we were, um, you know, well on the path to closing Afghanistan. I didn't think that we would be completely uh, as a country out of Afghanistan. Um, more importantly, uh, I I did not anticipate much like the majority of people, um, you know, what we saw uh later on that that summer i i i had feelings that my partners who you know i was i was vested in in the south that they were going to have a uh an extremely difficult time 
and were unlikely to to hold the gains they made. Um, but I, I thought that we would have some sort of role from a central location in Kabul um, where we continue to to help in Title 20 State Department type things, some some military assistance. Um, but when I left Kandahar, I was fairly certain that um, I would not be we, the U.S. military, would not be coming back there. Right. Good. Hey, Rob, Rob, to, 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 to yeah. tell you just just real quick, Rob, you know, anytime, you know, you leave uh, from from a, a long deployment, you're like, well, this is the last time I'll be back here. You know, famous last words of many, a uh, many a soldier over the last 20 years. But this time was uh, was for certain. Rob, I'm sorry. True. Yeah. Thanks. Ben. No, that's all right. I wanted to kind of to take on a, some of what you just said in response to Ron's question um, in, in terms of what what we might have done differently um, if and when we approach another long war, what we might do differently. And I think you kind of, you know, uh, alluded to the fact that we knew what we were doing when we went in there. And I think operationally speaking, we certainly did. You know, it was a counterterrorism mission, right? We were holding accountable those who perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. And it says as much in the authorization for the use of military force. Uh, but I'd offer to you I, that from a strategic again, and, and I'm looking at Afghanistan from you know, what brought our nation to war, uh, again, the national strategic and policy level. Um, it was only six months after we invaded Afghanistan that the president then kind of moved the goalpost on us, right? He was uh, given a speech at VMI. And we went from a kind of a, a tidy, understandable counterterrorism mission to what became a counterinsurgency, right? What became a, you know, federal government, uh, centralized power. We need to have a strong security uh, establishment. We want to have a great educational system uh, with gender equality for boys and girls, right? And so the mission, the mandate uh, exploded. It grew exponentially uh, on us. And that's where I would offer the mission started to, to slide. And uh, Matt, you, you kind of concluded your remarks by saying, you know, President Biden brought us full circle by, you know, inquiring what are our vital interests. I I would offer that that should have been the question we were asking twenty years earlier instead of at the conclusion uh, of the war. And so, what do we do differently? Again, from a national perspective, um, you have to look at each of the vertexes of of the Trinity. In my opinion, right? it's not just what could the military do better. The military did an admirable job achieving what we were asked to do, right? But what is the actual political end state that we want to achieve? What is the change in the condition that we want to achieve, right? And then from a societal level, do we have society involved, right? Do they have agency in the war, in the conduct of the war, right? They're the ones who are um, subscribing to provide the resources through their elected officials, right? And in Afghanistan, you know, there was a, a Gallup poll in 2019 where fewer than half of the respondents, right, a national survey, fewer than half could identify Afghanistan as a country that gave safe haven to Al Qaeda uh, before 9/11. Fewer than half. We've been there for 20 years almost, and half the nation didn't know, didn't understand that, right? Uh, and so you have to have the nation on board. Um, you know, I, I bring it back to I think there has to be I call it the three Ds, right? Death, draft, and debt, right? If they're not inconvenienced by the war, by one of the three things, I'm not saying we have to have all all three, right? But if if society is not inconvenienced by the war, they don't have an interest in the conduct of the war, and they don't have the agency that they need to have in the war. And therefore, they are, uh, they're they not providing the, the pressure on the policymakers who in turn aren't turning the screws on the military leaders, right? And so what takes a nation into war? You have to have all three parts uh, in some semblance of balance, the military, society, and the government. Yeah. I, I mean, and and I, 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 this is a good time to bring Kevin in here too, because the issue of, you know, Kevin, when you went, when you were over in Afghanistan, when you initially went to deal with issues of governance and anti-corruption, um, you know, that already suggests a slightly different mission than the initial mission of, you know, catching Osama bin Laden. Um, and how, how, what, what, when did you first go to Afghanistan and did you have a sense of that the mission was different than the mission would have been from somebody who went in for Operation Afghani Freedom in uh, November of 2001? Yeah, great question. Um, I went in uh, 2012 to 2013 uh -huh. um, and we were in a phase of uh, insider attacks uh, and significant levels of corruption within the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense. 
Um, and quite frankly, as a green suitor who is assigned to Task Force Shafafia, but also working side by side with AFPAC hands, the pre-deployment education process wasn't uh, very robust. And as a young major, I, I could have probably done a better job. Um, however, there was no system in place for individual augmentees to become better informed culturally, uh, nationally, subnationally, subnational structures in terms of corruption and the influences on legitimacy in the host nation. It, it was a significant challenge uh, going out with the uh, within the, the zones of Afghanistan and trying to stand up and implement counter-corruption uh, apparatuses uh, to basically educate those organizations on uh, the importance of, of corruption and the impact on their nation. I think that th one of the biggest things that I didn't understand and which really signaled a, a, a significant difference between the initial objectives, this is a cultural... Uh, phenomenon, and it's it's something that is totally different than what we were tasked to do initially uh, in deploying to Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean this, I, I and and I guess this this brings full circles a lot of what we've been talking about is you know what you're what you're told you're going to do before you go there, um, what you see when you're there, um, what that does to you know because you're talking about you're a professional, you went there, you were given a job to do, and you were going to do the job that you were given to do. But when you begin to see the, the significance of the barriers to your success, when you left Afghanistan for the last time, and so I guess you left in 2013 and you did not go back, did you, did you feel like you'd accomplished your mission? That's a, that's a very difficult question. Yeah. Uh, and I have, I have mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, while I feel like that we expose them to systems of honor, accountability, and transparency, uh, that we expose them to modified investigative techniques, uh, to, um, to methods to increase the legitimacy of their institutions, I also believe that it was too much to overcome in, in the short period of time that we were there. I think that it is a it is a generational issue and it's such, it's so much ingrained to their culture that it is, it is part of their way of life. Um, the petty and administrative corruption is, is a day-to-day -day thing for them. Um, and the corruption within the institutions um, is the, really represents the intersection of, of policy and strategy to the local population. Um, so it is very, very difficult to overcome in a short period of time, right? In my opinion, and and I guess Rob, to 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 pull back to you, we're just about out of time. But going back to the Trinity, and you know, I can't I can't get enough of talking about Uncle Carl, so uh, this makes me very happy. <laughs> but um, but that if you don't have society, if you don't have a clear sense of what you're asking of society, because this is I guess this is what I'm struggling with too. It's like that the American people's relative lack of interest in the war gave the politicians and the military leadership a great deal of leeway. Because if, if they're not under pressure, right, then, because after all, if the public were interested and were putting pressure on, the military would complain, ah, the, pre the press was looking over our shoulder and the people were looking over our shoulder. But when the people aren't interested, the military is like, oh, what do you expect us to do? Nobody cares. Um, that, you know, from a, from a civilian perspective, right, that sounds like an all-purpose cop-out. But what should, once again, there's that should again, what should the relationship between sort of larger societal interest and military leadership be in dealing with a problem like Afghanistan? Yeah. So again, it's a catch 22, right? Because when society is not fully engaged, that, that does provide a bit of flexibility, uh, sans scrutiny. Right. 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 Uh, and that's not necessarily, but I mean, it, this is not, um, this is not war as uh, Americans, uh, are used to or like to think war exists as right this this you know great battle of good and evil and you know you can tell who the good guys are the bad guys are and this is a war on terrorism and you have to be agile nimble you have to be responsive proactive right and so that absence of agency um, it's not necessarily all bad right particularly as it pertains to being able to execute our mission um, 
but that relationship does have to be there because that's the oversight and that's the way the, the framers of our constitution intended this nation uh, really to be to be designed, this government to be designed. Um, and so you've you've got to bring them into the conversation through the policymakers, right? Uh, and that's how that, that's how they're, they're they're involved. And again, it goes back to what you know what I'd call the, the three D's: the death, uh, debt, and draft. I think those are options or levers right, to kind of induce societal engagement, um, and also an increase in foreign policy literacy. Right, <laughs> the nation is just. Yeah, it, there's no saliency in foreign policy, and that's not a surprise to anybody who studies the subject, right? It's domestic issues that, that drive the domestic engine, uh, and therefore, there's just not a whole lot of interest in what's happening overseas. It's too far removed from the average individual, uh, and we see that playing out in Ukraine right now, right? So there's, again, how do you, how do you entice that relationship? Um, I think that's, that's a tricky question, but that's it's necessary. It is. Uh, although I will say that the one thing that allows me to bring it back to the beginning of this conversation is the purpose of the Eisenhower program is to encourage this kind of interplay between um, military, you know, you as war college students between the military and the broader society so that we can think about these things together. One would like to believe that the United States would avoid getting into any more uh, deep commitments without full buy-in and information of the broader public. Um, we hope that American leaders and the American public will take the time to care where we are sending young people like yourselves um, overseas. Um, we don't know. You know the, the, the beauty of making foreign policy or making any policy is uh, you make mistakes and you hope that none of them are catastrophic um, and you hope that you'll have opportunities to make you know more new, better, different mistakes in the future. Um, if we can do that, that's great. If we can't do that, uh, well, but, well, we hope that the United States will be around for a long time and perhaps there will be, we will learn from this experience. We'll take something away from it. We hopefully we can learn from each other when we have conversations like this one. I want to thank the three of you for being here for this conversation. Um, we are just about out of time now. But uh, Matt Adamchik, Rob Greiner, Kevin Payne, thank you for your service. Thank you for joining us for this conversation on A Better Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. And thanks to the rest of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all of the programs. Send us your thoughts about future programs. Please subscribe to A Better Peace on your podcatcher of choice because I know that you want to and you know that you want to. And after you have subscribed, please rate and review this podcast so that other people can find out about us as well. We're always interested in broadening this community for more conversations like this one. And even though this particular conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you to the next one. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.